Ladies and gentlemen, my name's Paul. Hopefully you're having an amazing day. So, <laughs> yeah, AMD's event was a thing, wasn't it? To say that they had impressive announcements is to seriously undersell the event. CDNA 2 looked honestly astounding, absolutely trouncing their previous efforts as well as NVIDIA's current latest and greatest GPUs. And, well, we also got some tantalizing glimpses of the future as well. But there's so much stuff to discuss, let's actually kind of work backwards, because I do want to give you guys an update of not only the 5NM process from TSMC, but also Zen 4 as well. This was something that AMD did actually tease at the end of the event but again I do feel that it's so interesting that I just kind of want to get it over and done with. So let's start things out with the actual um, way that this technology is going to be enabled and that is the 5nm HPC process from TSMC. The highlights here is that it offers two times the density, two times power efficiency and up to 1.25 times the performance compared to its previous generation node. Now this obviously is going to be of critical importance going forward for AMD. Now it's worth noting of course that 5NM and other processors from TSMC can be leveraged by other companies, but still it's going to be a very impressive node. And of course, in terms of CPUs anyway, it's going to put a ton of pressure on Intel going forward. So as for Genoa, which of course is going to be based on the Zen 4 cores, there are 96 CPU cores, which actually are part and parcel of Genoa with an asterisk. We'll get into that in just a moment. And of course, it will support the latest technologies such as PCIe 5.0 and CXL, as well as DDR5 memory. That's not too surprising. Now, what's really interesting about this is we also have enhanced security features. AMD have told us that it's sampling to customers now and that they're getting really good feedback and it is going to be on track for 2022 production and launch. Furthermore though, on top of Genoa, well, there was another very interesting thing and that is that we're going to be seeing Zen 4C. And this is basically designed for, well, the cloud. So there are significant improvements in terms of energy efficiency and um, well, basically speaking, this is going to be part of Bergamo. Now, this particular series of processors, again, this is going to specifically be focused on the cloud, is going to be designed around, well, basically leadership performance. AMD seems very confident that they're going to retain the performance crown with their CPUs. And honestly, I suspect in the data center, this is going to be the case. I'll discuss more about that in possibly another video, but we are going to be seeing up to 128 cores here, which, you know, when you think about it, guys, like 128 cores, it's absolutely, it's, it's mind blowing. I mean, honestly though, just think back, what, five years ago, I suppose, and, you know, ignore processors like, you know, the thread rippers and all of that, like, because, well, they're awesome, but a lot of folks don't really need those, you know, they're not doing, you know, scientific work, they're not working on huge data sets or possibly working on, you know, large animation projects, but even so... Having something like a 5950X, for example, and 16 cores is absolutely phenomenal. Now, Intel are competing very well with Alder Lake, at least in my personal opinion. Let me know what you feel about Alder Lake. And Raptor Lake is also going to be a nice step in the right direction as well, I feel. But ultimately, core counts have increased a lot. And this is predominantly, at least I think anyway, thanks to AMD. And I do believe that competition between the two is going to get a lot fiercer. However, it is going to take time, I think, for Intel to really start to move out of the shadow. And there's been a lot of issues that uh, Intel have faced. I think that they've had, you know, poor management problems. And I, I don't really, it's very easy to blame Intel's former CEO. I don't really feel that that's, that's fair, honestly. Like, the guy had so much, um, I, you know, I don't want to say too much because I was told a few things under the table. But let's just say that, you know, a lot of the Intel, you know, the management problems at Intel, I believe Jim over Adore TV actually discussed some of this at length. 
Um, but yeah, I mean, ultimately speaking, there were a ton of problems that was rife through the company. And I do feel that Intel is a lot leaner. I think it's better now. I think that they've made a number of replacements and I feel that, you know, they are getting back on track. But the thing is, AMD are executing absolutely relentlessly. But I don't want to talk too much more about Zen 4 because there is so much to discuss in this event. It would, you know, this video will end up being like two hours long if I keep going like this. So instead, let's move on to their other CPUs, and this is Milan X. So the best way of thinking of Milan X, if you're at all familiar with the Ryzen V cache, basically take that in your head and then multiply it a ton of times because, well, you know what Milan is. Obviously, it's a server-based processor, and that's essentially what AMD have done here using their package technology to plonk, that's a technical term, a buttload of cache, which is going to augment the L3 cache of the CPU. Now, one of the benefits, of course, adding a ton of L3 cache, or just cache in general to a processor, you know, whether it's L1, L2, whatever, is that you are essentially allowing the CPU to have access to a larger set of data, but without needing to farm itself out to DDR4 or DDR5 or whatever is on your particular system. That's all wonderful, isn't it? How you get a shoulder itch or something like that, and you're like, yeah, this is the worst time ever. Now, naturally, you can only fit a certain amount of data in a cache. You know, you can't have like a 5 billion gigabyte, I'm, I'm being silly here, amount of cache on your chip. But obviously, larger amounts of cache is so important. And this is one of the reasons because you get quite a lot of instructions which are common. In other words, they're going, you know, you're going to consistently access certain a data, uh, sorry, segments of data or whatever, and obviously caching and actually predicting what data is going to be used is, <laughs> it's, it's a very complicated topic and that's putting it absolutely mildly. That's why branch prediction and all this other stuff um, and just being able to actually manage threads is so important. Like, you know, if you had this just just be absolutely ridiculous for a moment. If you had like a, you know, a 5,000 plus CPU core processor, but you weren't able to actually access the data correctly or for it to actually predict what data needs what, or you weren't able to actually pull data in quickly enough from the memory or the cache system. It doesn't matter. Those cores are just going to be essentially idle. So what AMD have done here is they've added an absolute ridiculous amount of cache to the processor. Uh, speaking about specifics just for a moment, they have actually added 804 megabytes of total cache per socket. Now, I just want to illustrate that this is split across uh, 64 Zen free cores, and this is also socket compatible. So AMD have stated that, of course, you do need to do a BIOS update for this, but it basically triples the L3 cache on uh, Milan X, which again is absolutely just, is mind blowing. So if we compare the numbers between Milan X and Milan. So obviously they're still using Zen 3. There's no major changes to the architecture. It's not like, you know, they've done major changes to the IPC or anything like that. It's essentially the same core, albeit enabled with this, uh, with this additional cache. Well, it does really good things. I mean, you can see some of the results yourself on screen, but essentially we are looking at over a 50% speed up 66%, for example, in this specific task versus Milan. Now, this gives you a really good insight into how AMD can empower various technologies going forward for a host of different things, including, of course, APUs and having a, you know, an APU, for example, for the data center and being able to it just, well, feed it that amount of data. It's, it's, it's actually really exciting, the prospects that we could be looking at here. So the bottom line is, though, that AMD are, well, they just, they are firing all cylinders. This is a really nice upgrade. This is like... This is essentially a generational uplift. And we can imagine how this is going to continue proceeding forward with future AMD architectures such as Zen 4, Zen 5, and so on, and so on, and so on. It's going to be very interesting to see how AMD move forward after this. There's an awful lot of stuff that I want to say, but again, given this video, I kind of feel like if I dive too much into a specific topic, this video is going to get really long. But I also want to touch on CDNA. You see what I'm saying, guys? There's just so much crap to talk about. Ah! Um, so AMD, of course, have had a GPU architecture roadmap that's been publicly available for some time now. Um, we obviously had GCN, which was their first 7nm data center GPU. Then we had CDNA, which was a second generation one. But now we are essentially um, going to be shifting to CDNA2. 
So this is their third generation Infinity architecture, which basically is moving towards Exascale. We'll get into specifics in just a moment. Now they are claiming this gives them leadership in high performance computing. So a 4.9 times increase than their competition, which of course is NVIDIA. We'll get again into specifics in just a moment. Now it's important to realize that this 4.9 figure will depend upon different tasks and applications. And it's gonna be very interesting to see how others are gonna benchmark this and independently verify it, which of course is another thing entirely. But just to give you guys some of the overview here, <laughs> yeah, I mean, oh boy, 58 billion transistors on the 6NM process. So that rumor was right. It is actually using 6NM. 220 compute units total for their um, for the GPUs that they've shown off so far, with 128 gigabytes of memory. Now. That's a lot of RAM. You could you could train a lot of cat pictures on that for AI, I'm just saying. Um, but this is up to 3.2 terabytes per second aggregate bandwidth and 880 second generatrix matrix cores. And yeah, I mean, there's not much more to say other than those figures because that is absolutely, well... <laughs> That's kind of that's kind of ridiculous. I'll get into the architecture side in just a moment because I do want to talk just a couple of specifics in terms of performance because I feel otherwise we're jumping around, so I'm not going to follow the uh, format exactly of what they were covering. So in terms of performance then, well, you can see yourself versus the A100, which of course is NVIDIA's card, that in terms of the FP64 vector operations, they are looking at a 4.9 times increase over NVIDIA, which, I mean, that's kind of fast, right? <laughs> um... And again, of course, as I just mentioned, 128 gigabytes of RAM, which is a 60% increase over the uh, A100. But perhaps the most mind-blowing figure, you know, total is the FP16, which of course is half precision operations or FP, oh, sorry, BF16 matrix operations. So again, those are half precision operations. But even so, we're looking at 383 teraflops of performance. I mean, damn, I imagine... Just imagine that level of performance. It kind of didn't seem too long ago that we were like, you know, just absolutely astounded by four T flops or five T flops or whatever. Now we're like <laughs> almost four hundred T flops of performance. It, it just, yeah, that's uh, that's a lot of flops. But getting specifically into the architecture, and I'm sure we're going to see a lot more about this because AMD have basically said that they're going to provide more of a breakdown. There's a couple of very interesting things that they've disclosed. You can see yourself the overall kind of dice shot, if you will. And also there's been multiple kind of trailers that they've shown out, shown throughout the event, excuse me. So there are two AMD CDNA2 dies present here as well as second generation cores for HPC and AI. So those are the uh, matrix cores that uh, AMD have talked so much about in previous uh, discussions. There are eight stacks of HBM2E. The E part is rather important. And of course, because this is a 3D stacked chip, I might discuss more about this in another video, but basically we're looking at a 2.5D elevated fan out bridge. There's been actually a number of patents regarding this in the past. Um, and I have to say that it does look really cool what this can enable. Finally, we also are seeing ultra high bandwidth uh, die interconnects and coherent GPU to GPU interconnects. So obviously this means that multiple GPUs can communicate with one another. And this is also a very important aspect of this because AMD are really working on not just GPU to GPU communication, but CPU to CPU, or sorry, CPU to GPU communication and also accelerating those workloads. And they are doing a buttload of stuff to actually enable this, to make it a lot easier for developers to port code over that would typically be kind of running on the GPU and then to accelerate either sections a or and or all of the code on the GPU instead. I do want to also talk about a couple of performance benchmarks. Now, obviously, this is not necessarily all of the workloads that you would see, but a couple of very interesting ones. At worst, something like LSMS is going to hit about 1.6 times performance increase over the A100. But in best case scenarios such as AMG, it could be three times increase 
which again, I've, you know, I've said this before, but that is absolutely bonkers. We also have another benchmark, um, which is basically Lamp's uh, combustion simulation. Yeah, um, basically, you can see the final result. Um, NVIDIA basically are at 45% of the way through the simulation, whereas on the other hand, well, obviously, NVIDIA, uh, uh, sorry, AMD have actually finished the benchmark. So essentially, we're looking at up to, well, just over a two times performance increase there. Ultimately, AMD are still definitely holding stuff back, and it's going to be very interesting to see what they disclose further on. Um, but... You can already see some of the building blocks of what we are possibly going to be seeing from RDNA 3 and also future architectures from AMD. And honestly, it's going to be very interesting to see how AMD grows as a company, not just in terms of the products that they release, but, well, just their size, <laughs> because their stock prices, they've been going brr recently. If you invested back in, what was it like, you know, uh, 2011, 2012, or, you know, when they're at the lowest points, you would have been really happy by now. <laughs> Let's just put it that way. And it's really interesting to see how AMD have just absolutely done a turnaround. And you've got to remember that, you know, while AMD are definitely a lot more lucrative and larger than what they were, and they're hiring a crap ton of talent at the moment, just up and down the stack, not just marketing, but also, you know, everything from, you know, software and, uh, you know, hardware guys, all the way up and down the stack. It's going to be very interesting to see how AMD grows that way. But I feel that they are definitely on a, a, an upward trajectory. And it's going to be curious because the company is still quite small in terms of just overall market cap for example compared to something like intel now, that's not to say that intel is doomed i think intel are definitely going to be very competitive and at the end of the day ampere you know it's how do i say this ampere is a great product but it's not you know the next generation product and cdna from or cdna2 from amd is so at the end of the day, we have to wait to see how uh, AMD are going to be countered by NVIDIA. But what I am trying to say is, no matter what, even if NVIDIA does work out to be a little bit faster in the end when they release their chips or a little bit slower, it doesn't really matter. The fact is that AMD are now clawing data center market share. And while I know a lot of folks don't necessarily work in the data center, but it's kind of one of those things where just about everyone is benefiting from this tech, whether you work in a data center or you use this stuff, you know, yourself. Because, well, a ton of this stuff, like, for example, it could be running your cloud, you know, cloud gaming uh, with the uh, Epic processors. Or you could be benefiting from faster designs of CPUs and GPUs, for example. There's a ton, there's a ton of stuff that we can, you know, fast iteration of design in general, just because of the simulations that you could run on the CPU, for example. But getting back to my point, the fact of the matter is that this is going to benefit AMD simply because they're getting so much more cash. You know, when they're selling these Epic processors or whatever, at the end of the day, those things are costing the client a lot of money and there's a huge margin there. And you're also talking about a massive amount of volume. It's going to be fascinating to see how the industry evolves. With that said, thank you very much for checking out the video. I'll see you soon. Take care of yourselves. Stay safe and have an amazing day. Bye for now.